552 feet above the Straits of Mackinac, one can see a view that until 1957 was available only to birds and pilots. The Straits of Mackinac is a five mile wide stretch of water that was created by a melting glacier nearly 13,000 years ago. It is the meeting place of two of the five great lakes. Here through this five mile wide strip of water, known as the Straits of Mackinac, Shipping men anticipate that one day more traffic will pass than the combined tonnage that sails through the Panama and Suez canals. While connecting these bodies of water, the Straits acts as a barrier between Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas. Until the latter half of this century, a boat crossing was required in order to go from one part of the state to the other. That crossing used to take an hour or more, depending on the weather and the backup of traffic. In late November, as deer hunters converged to Michigan's game-rich UP, the wait for a ferry crossing could be as long as a day. Then came November 1st, 1957, the day the ferry stopped and the Mighty Mac was opened. behind the building of the Mackinac Bridge. Who thought of it first? How was it financed? Who designed the structure? Who actually built it? And what the heck is a pasty? It's 11 a.m. on a Saturday in late November, 55 stories above the Straits of Mackinac, over 750 feet above the bottom of the Straits. Retired iron worker J.C. Stillwell stands high atop Pier 20, the north tower of the Mackinac Bridge. Last time I was up here, it was about 40 years ago, 1956. Me and Blackie Blackledge, Burwell, and uh, Tallman, I guess his name was. Uh -huh. We set the last piece. J.C. is one of the hundreds of men who, starting in 1954, spent 42 months building the Mighty Mac. A self-described young buck in those days, J.C. today runs the Mackinac Bridge Museum in Mackinac City. Only 24 hours prior to this visit to the top of Pier 20, 75 mile an hour winds had forced the Mackinac Bridge Authority to temporarily close the structure to traffic as a standard safety procedure. While the bridge itself is practically aerodynamically transparent, vehicles such as high profile trucks are not. So on the rare occasions when the winds in the Straits area reach such velocity, the result can be escorted convoys led by the bridge patrol. About they got that bridge open yet? Yeah, they're letting everything across uh, with an escort. And I'm in the middle of a bridge right now, and it's not that bad at all. Yeah, well, I'll thank a big truck for waking me up. My two guys said, oh, yeah, we'll wake you up, we'll wake you up. I've been here since noon waiting for them to escort. I just started the escorts, and I fell asleep, and nobody woke me up. Okay, I'm waking you up. Come on. Yeah, I've never had flashing lights in front of me. They always seem to be behind me. Yeah. We're just in time. Here comes our escort. From the time the structure opened in 1957 until the completion of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York in 1964, the Mackinac Bridge was the world's longest suspension bridge. And today, when measured from anchor block to anchor block, the Mighty Mac still holds the record as being the longest. But unlike the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, the Mackinac is nearly 300 miles from any large population. So where does the story begin? Prentice M. Brown, Jr. is a lifelong resident of St. Ignis, Michigan, one of the earliest settlements in North America and the town at the north bridgehead of the Mighty Mac. Prentice M. Brown, Sr. is known as the father of the Mackinac Bridge. He uh, was born here in 1889 and uh, lived all of his life, uh, at least most of it, in St. Ignis. He became interested... Uh, in the Mackinac Bridge uh, in the early years. Lawrence A. Rubin was the first person hired by the Mackinac Bridge Authority in 1950. He served as the executive secretary of the authority until his retirement in 1983. He is also the author of two books about the bridge, Mighty Mac and Bridging the Straits, the Story of Mighty Mac. He resides in St. Ignace, close to the Mackinac Bridge. In my, my research, I go back and find references to it. Uh, in February of 1884, uh, when um, uh, one editor of a paper uh, close by said uh, the, the experiment to uh, provide year-round transportation across the Straits by boat has failed, and the only way we're ever going to have a connection is by building a bridge or a tunnel 
and uh, the, and the main difficulty is the financing. The man was had tremendous uh, uh, sense of the future. When uh, Mackinac Bridge was first envisioned, uh, and this was really before the turn of the century, there was a fellow by the name of Salson who ran a dry goods store down on our main street, and he uh, had a picture of of the Brooklyn Bridge, and he used it here. And someday uh, he thought that maybe that would inspire uh, a bridge across the Straits of Mackinac. Others, too, were interested in building a bridge, including Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the board members of the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. On July 1st, 1888, he said, We now have the largest, well-equipped hotel of its kind in the world for short-season business. Now what we need is a bridge across the straits. Nearly 60 years later, William Stewart Woodfell, the self-styled innkeeper of the Grand Hotel, became one of the prime movers in the pursuit of a straits bridge. Back in the 30s, in the late 30s, just before World War II, uh, Murray D. Van Wagner, who was also a member of the original Bridge Authority, uh, <clears throat> was highway commissioner and later governor. They built the causeway that you see uh, leading from the north uh, <clears throat> bank of the Straits of Mackinac south, and that extends out into the Straits of Mackinac by about... Uh, Oh, a mile, a little more than a mile. And uh, that saved a lot of money for this bridge construction. It was kind of interesting to know that they had done that back in the late 30s, and it was going to help the bridge. Then came Pearl Harbor. The double suspension bridge was shot right off the drawing board. Whoa, some pretty hefty bombs to blow away a drawing. Fortunately, they missed the causeway, and following World War II, the idea of a bridge was brought up again, this time by a young politician who was running for governor of Michigan and was on the campaign trail in St. Ignace. That is true. Uh, <clears throat> Soapy Williams, G. Menon Williams, who was running for governor in 1948, Soapy did come to St. Ignace, and uh, he was getting a haircut. And Soapy, of course, was a great person for meeting people. If he went to a supper somewhere, he'd meet everybody everywhere. And anyway, he talked to the barber here in St. Ignace. And indeed, he did come out and advocate <clears throat> for Mackinac Bridge. And he said, if I am elected, I'm going to do everything I can to have a bridge built across the Straits of Mackinac. The building of the bridge was not as big a problem, as far as I was concerned, as getting the money. Uh, we encountered ex extreme provincialism on the part of the uh, East Coast financiers who had only a vague idea of Michigan, which they thought was close to California. We tried uh, first to get some big uh, underwriter to take it on, and uh, uh, they, they turned us down, despite the connections of uh, Prentice M. Brown, a former United States Senator, uh, chairman of the board of Detroit Edison, and Charles T. Fisher, the vice chairman, who was the um, president, uh, chairman of the board of uh, the National Bank of Detroit, one of the largest banks in the country. And uh, they had all the contacts that anybody could dream about for a project of this kind. But because it was a bridge perceived to be in a uh, remote area with 900 persons living in Mackinac City, one bridgehead, and the 3,000 in the other bridgehead, and uh, being uh, uh, 300 miles from the nearest big center of population, the uh, New Yorkers just uh, couldn't conceive of a project involving $100 million in this area. The two big projects, I suppose, that were most pressing was, number one, financing, and uh, number two, could it be done? One of the first acts of the authority was to engage a group of prominent long-span bridge engineers, including the internationally known Dr. David B. Steinman, destined to design the greatest bridge of his career. There were a number of other things that uh, all combined to give the uh, financiers uh, uh, doubts about it, uh, the, in addition to the uh, paucity of the population, uh, the 
uh, winds and the ice and the uh, flow of the water through the straits uh, was condemned by many people, presumably in the know, and they said no, a bridge couldn't be built that would withstand the forces of nature up here. Throughout the country and all over the world, somehow people seem to boast of the severity of their meteorological conditions, and they don't realize that the same nature that presents these forces also presents us with the laws whereby these forces can be conquered. And that's what engineering is, the application of natural laws for the mastery of natural forces. Oh, he was a great, great person, very interesting, very uh, sure of himself, little fellow, uh, about five feet two or three, and with a deep voice, or a uh, deep resonant voice. And when he spoke, he spoke with authority, and uh, was he was a genius, no question in my mind about that. He was the one also who gambled. We uh, didn't have enough money to uh, have a consulting engineer prepare drawings on which the contractors could bid. The result was that he ventured his own capital spent about a quarter of a million dollars in payroll and came up with about 60 pages of blueprints on which the American Bridge, Bethlehem Steel and other steel contractors and, and foundation contractors could bid so that we could go to the financiers and say, this project is going to cost X million dollars and we're going to have so many, that's how many bonds we'll need to sell and do so with authority rather than picking some figure out of the thin air for bond underwriting. You know, the greatest wind storm that has ever been recorded in the vicinity of Mackinac is 78 miles an hour. That corresponds to a wind pressure of 20 pounds per square foot. We took that figure of 20, we multiplied it by two and a half, and we assumed a wind pressure of 50 pounds per square foot for the design of this bridge. It was funny, he made the statement that, the, and he said it clearly, theoretically, the bridge is uh, aerodynamically perfect and could stand winds, uh, theoretical winds, up to 600 miles an hour. The newspapers picked it up and ran headlines, back on our bridge stand, withstands winds of 600 miles an hour. And they would never change it. I mean, it was great. And uh, it was embarrassing uh, to him and to the rest of us who knew that that was a theoretical statement. But it is just about aerodynamically perfect as any bridge can be. I remember the day that they uh, had the ceremony for the bridge starting, and it was around the 4th or 5th of May, I think, in 1954. And uh, they had the groundbreaking, and my mother was there, and Governor Williams and all the members of the authority, and uh, they had a great groundbreaking. The, the jets flew over, and... Uh, and that was kind of exciting for us up here, too. That was the start of the bridge. The two primary construction firms hired by the Bridge Authority to build the structure were Merritt, Chapman & Scott and the American Bridge Division of U.S. Steel. Merritt, Chapman & Scott would build the 34 massive piers required, while American Bridge would manufacture and construct the superstructure. Ed Haltenhoff was the chief engineer for Merritt, Chapman & Scott and later became the operations manager for the Bridge Authority. The two main tower piers were built using a caisson design. These were large double-walled cylinders which were fabricated in Gary, Indiana and assembled in a shipyard in Alpena, Michigan, nearly 80 miles from the Straits. Ed Haltenhoff. The caissons, uh, uh, 19 and 20, the shells were originally built down in Alpena and launched and towed up by a uh, tug. Uh, when in Alpena, there was a couple of uh, problems that we had, uh, one of which uh, meant uh, we had to uh, refloat a caisson and patch it because of some uh, dynamiting that we were using to try to break through uh, to form a channel out to the lake so towing could begin. Uh, so it took about uh, three weeks or so to straighten that one out down there. And then, of course, when the uh, caissons were brought up and put in these corrals that we had, we had a constant problem with them spinning like a top. Uh, it wasn't necessarily in only one direction. They'd pick the direction they wanted to go. But the mass of the steel made it almost impossible to stop them. Uh, even with uh, very, very large size cables. Of course, uh, as the uh, sinking progressed, this was less and less of a problem, uh, and pretty soon it disappeared. Getting the caisson down to bedrock 
was a carefully calculated, painstaking process that required more than six months to complete. The first stage, of course, getting a foothold, and uh, that was accomplished in the first construction season. Uh, they got six of those foundations in, the six most important ones. And uh, to me, it looked just absolutely fantastic. And, and we're, we're, we're off and running. We can, I could see a bridge physically before it was purely mental. The trestle that you see sticking out the top was a construction uh, innovation, a need that we had. Uh, we had to get a crane up very high uh, to, to work on this. We couldn't work on it from the water. In addition to that, uh, we wanted some stability uh, so that we could work on days when uh, the weather was rough. Uh, so we constructed one of these trestles on each of the uh, piers. Uh, they were removed later when the construction was done. Uh, the cranes were placed up there by the rig, uh, one of the rigs that you see there. And when the work was done, uh, they were removed in the same way. With the coarse aggregates in place, an intrusion mortar is injected under pressure. Pipes through which the grout is pumped into the aggregate are positioned at 20-foot intervals. As the mortar level rises, these pipes are raised and the process is repeated. Uh, all of the rigs had names. Uh, previously, we had just seen a shot of the one of the 35-ton rigs that was called the Seminole. Uh, this amounted to uh, uh, mixers on, on the scow, uh, and it would work uh, along with one of the rigs uh, with a sand scow on one side and a cement and fly ash scow on the other. The cement and fly ash would be put up into the bins uh, with a uh, pneumatic system uh, the sand would be put up into the hopper, as you're seeing being done right now, uh, by the rigs. And so it, uh, it was a, a self-contained type of, uh, of operation. I believe that if we had to use conventional concreting methods, and I'm certainly that I'd get a lot of support for this from an engineering perspective, that it would uh, have taken probably two to three times longer uh, to build the bridge than it uh, actually did. The cost of building the Mackinac Bridge was almost $100 million. High-level construction workers have a rule of thumb that says for every $10 million spent on such a project, one life will be lost. This was not true with the building of the Mighty Mac. However, five people did lose their lives. James R. Lesage, an employee with Merritt Chapman and Scott, fell to his death while working on the foundation for Pier 20. Within a month of this tragedy, another life was lost. This time, it was diver Frank Pepper. Diving work was very important to the operation because when you work in the water there's always the need to work underwater uh, and the divers were the specialists that did this uh, for us. We had several divers uh, on the project uh, they all wore what we call hard hats the old time uh, type of equipment uh, that's still used today because of the conditions under which these construction divers work uh, but these people would be able to go down there and do uh, amazing things such as burning steel and, and welding and measuring and patching and doing many things underwater. Unfortunately, the diver that we're looking at is one that uh, uh, was killed on the project. This diver's name was Frank Pepper. Uh, for whatever reason, he popped up to the surface by putting air into his suit. Uh, and as a result, uh, he ended up in the decompression chamber, which we had available. Uh, and unfortunately, the, uh, the pressure chamber did not uh, bring full recovery. And a few days later, uh, Frank passed away. Despite these two tragic deaths in 1954, the workers were able to make great progress in establishing a foothold in the Straits during the first season of bridge construction. The weather was so mild that work on the foundations was able to continue into January of the following year. These people were very, very astounded to find that we were able to work until the 14th of January. But I specifically remember on the 14th of January, Grover Denny, the product project uh, manager coming into my office, and telling me that uh, today was it, that he was going to shut the job down today. And I was usually the one that got the weather reports and uh, gave him advice as to what was going on. Uh, and of course, my advice was no better than the weather uh, person's. But that day, there was nothing in the weather report that said there was going to be any problems as far as cold and storm. Well, uh, the project manager proved to be perfectly right and the weatherman uh, traditionally wrong, uh, because all of a sudden, uh, towards the afternoon, the wind started to blow. Uh, and it was a real race for us to get the equipment from the lake, from the straits, around the bend into St. Agnes Harbor, uh, where they would be safe. And then immediately we winterized and uh, never got back out until the spring again. Uh, how uh, Grover Denny knew that that was the day, I'll, I'll never know, but perhaps that's why he was the project manager. 
In the meantime, American Bridge had all kinds of uh, structure going on. The railroad yard here in St. Ignace was just full of steel. The steel work, uh, to, to describe it in the terms of um, one of the consulting engineers, is like an erector set. They uh, design the steel and they, and they form it and cut it and put it together uh, in, a, in a yard. Uh, I walked on the towers of the uh, Mackinac Bridge uh, when they were laid out flat on the yard. <laughs> Once the foundation work was essentially finished, the next step was to bring in American Bridge and a special breed of men, the iron workers. J.C. Stillwell was one of them. He still resides in Mackinac City and runs the Mackinac Bridge Museum. He is also the head of the International Iron Workers Festival, which is held there every summer in the shadows of the Mighty Mac. But we had men from all over the world. And, you know, California. Most of them uh, drove black cars and uh, uh, Airstream trailers, silver Airstream trailer. You could know, and we call them boomers, you know. They boom from one bridge to another, one state to another. They're a bunch of hell of guys. Hundreds of men setting new erection and safety records while working two shifts for 42 months. The construction period uh, was the forerunner of many, many uh, economic changes for the Straits of Mackinac. St. Ignace uh, was primarily the town that was going to be responsible for housing four, five, six hundred workers. We would come and build the bridge. The iron workers, the foundation people, uh, it was really an exciting time. Uh, the restaurants, the motels, the theater, the churches, and everybody else uh, seemed to have a, a real upbeat attitude when it came. And it was a real boom town, as was Mackinac City. I, I'm told, I never attended one, but I'm told there was a continuous crap game at one of the uh, hotels. I mean, one shift would come on, one shift would go off, and the game never stopped. Uh, I, I'm not, whether that's apocryphal or not, I'm not sure, but uh, it's a good story. You could get a plate of uh, spare ribs, and a bath and for three dollars down there. <laughs> it was just a place to be. While that establishment left the area with most of the iron workers, JC's museum remains a popular stop in Mackinac City. Many an iron worker has hung his hat there. The hard hats and stuff here are the beginning of the museum. Some of them are original hard hats come off the bridge, some of them are personal friends. Everything upstairs is the Mackinac Bridge Museum and it is solely come off the Mackinac Bridge. The rest of the stuff in here I collected through the years from 1954 to. The iron workers were in business, and as Ed Hultenhoff states, the structure was to be unique in many ways. Important to note is that all of this was riveted construction. This was not, uh, as we use uh, commonly in, in modern construction, uh, bolting. The tongs were used to throw the rivets, and uh, then the forges to the left there, the forges filled with coal and red hot. The rivets come out to five or six hundred degrees. I don't know, they're quite hot anyway. This creeper derrick climbed up between the towers using the towers for support, similar to what an inchworm, uh, how an inchworm would work it. And that would then uh, place the tower sections one on top of the other. Uh, we'll see that working now as they uh, uh, go skyward. 1955 was a very busy season for the iron workers. From July to November, concentration was on completing the two main tower piers, each climbing over 55 stories above the straits. I work with some awesome men. They were gorgeous, rough, but good. Seems like the higher they went, the softer they talked. First I went out there, I thought maybe I was with a bunch of other guys. They call your baby and honey. And it seemed like the higher they got, the more closer to their partner they got, because if one of you made a mistake, the other one might be dead. So you watched each other like hawks up there. It was a very good job. One October day, they were topping off the towers. And I believe this would have been late 1956. Anyway, it was blowing, blowing, blowing. It was really blowing hard. <laughs> Coming from the southwest, which is usually a fair weather wind, but it can be a strong wind. And uh, I couldn't believe what I saw. He said, uh, 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 Mr. Brown, he said, uh, you're going to go up to the top. And I had my camera, movie camera, and, and we went up in a barrel, and <laughs> which was hooked on. And of course, you go up 
well, it's 500 and some feet from water to the top, so it was uh, maybe a 300 foot lift. Anyway, we got on the west side of this, of the South Tower Pier, and they finally brought up the last piece, the top off piece where the, where the iron workers were. And the top of the west side of that tower pier is in four sections. So they brought up a quarter of the top section. Anyway, they got to the top and they set it down. And then these fellows went out on the outside of this pier, you know, 300 feet drop to the lake, uh, at least, and uh, pinned it. And then four of these iron workers in that howling wind got up and then they put up a flag. They all stood up and uh, there, the space probably wasn't bigger than say four by five or six, which is one quarter of that tower pier. And uh, anyway, every time I go by that tower pier, <laughs> you know, I say, boy, those guys are lucky they didn't fall off that. Winter rolled into the Straits early in 55, shutting down construction sooner than the previous season. Yet work continued in the rail yards in St. Ignace. Steel structures for the roadways were arriving and needed to be assembled so that they could be barged out onto the piers in 1956. But before the roadways could be set, cables needed to be spun. And this required a catwalk, the bridgeman's walkway in the sky. This catwalk actually is made out of cyclone fence uh, that was put together uh, on shore in, in uh, rolls uh, and then uh, kicked off the tower, actually, uh, to uh, al allow the making of the catwalk. When this uh, catwalk is kicked off the top of the tower, uh, actually kicked off because it's fastened and then pushed down uh, and let to slide by gravity uh, on screw eyes. Uh, this was where the two uh, American bridge workers uh, met their death. They were working on uh, spreading the, the catwalk at the time on the top of the tower and uh, something snapped, uh, whatever it was, and both of them plunged down to the water. The two men who lost their lives were Jack Baker of Pagosa Springs, Colorado, and Robert Copen of Plymouth, Michigan. Two other iron workers who fell with a bundle of fencing that day were able to grab onto the fencing as it dangled over the straits. With the encouragement of their co-workers, they managed to climb up the fencing and were rescued. The work continued, and once the catwalk was completed, Work began on spinning the two main cables of the Mighty Mac. These are the two wheels. There's one on each side that spin the cable back and forth. What we see here is a couple of workers uh, taking the wire off the wheel that uh, just arrived. And uh, they're going to now put two new wires, or I should say one loop, uh, forming two wires on the wheel to send it back in the opposite direction. And the supply of cable or of wire uh, is up on top of the uh, superstructure. And we had a lot of instances on the job there. Uh, like one time we was over on Pier 22, me and my buddy Curly Olson, and we was always arguing who could run across that catwalk fastest. That was before the cable was there. It was just a swinging stage, what we call the catwalk. So the boss, about 3 o'clock that afternoon, he said, well, you guys have been arguing all the time. I'll see you a better fist of whiskey and see who can get across that catwalk. And that's going up over Tower 20 and 19 and down through the middle. It's about a four-mile run. Up and down. Up and down, yeah. Uh -huh. Anyway, he beat me on the first tower, and I got him on the second tower, and so we went down and got the fifth to whiskey and sat down and had a beer. This is uh, one of the teams uh, that would compete against each other, spinning the cable. Uh, both cables were spun at the same time or laid at the same time uh, the, uh, on either side, and there was a competition between the crews that were doing the laying, one at each anchorage, and then of course some men scattered out along the scaffold uh, to see who could uh, do the most in one shift and who could get finished sooner than the other. Uh, we could see here an iron worker uh, getting ready to let the wheel, uh, the spinning wheel, pass by. Uh, there was a kind of a clanking bell sound that uh, was on the wheel to warn workers that it was in their vicinity so that they would uh, be able to be on the alert and duck if it was uh, coming close to them. You can see the wires now, they're being bundled into uh, portions of wires that will then be bundled into the 24 and a half inch uh, diameter cable when it's complete. 340 wires were to be banded into a single strand. Then, 
in a predetermined order, 37 strands were to be assembled into a single cable. Actually, spinning the cable is a misnomer. Uh, the cable is not spun. It's laid in wires, individual wires that are bundled together into, into groups, and then the groups uh, are banded together into a total wire. Uh, and then there's a covering put over the top of that, uh, which perhaps uh, could look like spinning. It wraps around the cable. I think the term spinning comes from the uh, appearance of the type of equipment uh, that's being used rather than what the equipment is doing. The cable spinning operation went on for 24 hours a day until it was completed. During this time, the bridge authority received a letter from a lady who wanted to know how they expected a car to climb up and down the steep slopes. They informed her that the cable spinning platforms were not the actual road. When the spinning operations were completed, over 42,000 miles of wire had been laid in the two main cables. The structure was becoming famous, not only to those on the ground, but to a certain few in the air. Yes, uh, we had uh, several planes fly underneath during construction, uh, notably a National Guard plane uh, uh, with, uh, I think, 11 members of the National Guard in it, and one of them, uh, uh, we, we didn't get the numbers, so one of them, but one of them squealed. He flew under it. He was with the Army or Navy or something, and they grounded him. <laughs> he flew under it when we were building the bridge, and they didn't go for that. When the workers were pulled off the straits at the end of 56, work continued in the steel yards at St. Ignace on the remaining suspension trusses that would hold up the roadway. The last two years, we worked in the yard putting these sections together and then floating them out on the barge. So we had two winners. We worked in two winters we didn't work, so that gave you the 42 months. On May 17, 1957, the last of the suspended bridge truss sections was hoisted into place. For the first time, the two great peninsulas of Michigan were now linked by a bridge of concrete and steel. Rather than having solid concrete uh, deck as we do on the approach bands, uh, Steinman decided the best thing there would be to use uh, an open metal grid for a portion of it and uh, a, a grid filled with concrete for another portion. Uh, the idea here was to uh, be able to allow wind forces or wind itself to, to go up through the bridge, through the open portion of it, uh, and still give a good riding surface. Uh, going across the bridge on the open grid uh, is something that a lot of uh, drivers don't particularly care for because it does make a buzzing and it does seem like your car is not being steered properly. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, there's nothing really to be concerned. It's just part of the design. And the design of the Mackinac Bridge incorporated a number of innovative cost saving and recycling procedures. One was the key ingredient of the foundation mix, which was fly ash, a byproduct of Detroit Edison's coal-fired generating plants. The suspension cables for the catwalk were stretched and reused as the suspender cables that hold up the roadway. This log carrier was used by the contractors to carry the grid for the roadway. The uh, construction schedule called for the bridge to open November 1st. They were having difficulty, caused by weather, of getting the uh, uh, steel plates, the, uh, the grid, as we call it, getting that welded and down. And uh, they wanted an extension, and I threatened that if uh, they couldn't get their grids down, we'd get uh, wooden planks and put them in and run cars across on November 1st, come hell or high water. Well, they, the problem was overtime, and uh, they solved that by spending a few bucks, and uh, the bridge was open and complete so far as handling traffic was concerned. At the end of uh, 42 and a half months, uh, the bridge was open right on schedule, November 1st, 1957. It was a beautiful November, temperature, uh, running about 40, 50 degrees, sun shining. It was a gorgeous day, and the strange part of it was, as the executive officer, I recommended to the authority that we do not hold a uh, big celebration uh, in November for fear the weather would uh, be bad. And had it been that way, the, uh, any kind of a celebration would have been out of the question. Uh, you, you couldn't even stand up on the deck out there. But it turned out to be a gorgeous day, and uh, so we planned a dedication in uh, June. Uh, we had gale-like storms that week. <laughs> we planned a week-long dedication. And uh, floats were destroyed, tents were blown down. <laughs> Everything that we possibly uh, uh, 
you could go wrong did until the last two days of the dedication. It was a six-day event, and uh, the last two days it cleared up. So all's well, it ends well, and uh, re people were real pleased and happy. My father, uh, I think it was in 1955, he <clears throat> suffered a heart attack. And, uh, and I'm sure it was because of the uh, strain on him uh, in doing not only what he had to do in Detroit for Detroit Edison, but also for this uh, magnificent project. But uh, he was the chairman of uh, the opening ceremonies uh, in not only in, Feb uh, in November of 1957, but also the following June in 1958. Uh, I think of all the accomplishments that he felt that he was uh, a part of. Mackinac Bridge stands out as one of his uh, fondest dreams that came true. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great day for our Michigan. Today on firm foundations, reaching as far as 200 feet below these waters, we gaze upwards to towers higher than the Washington Monument. The graceful catenary of the sinewy cables are a delight to the eye as they mount from the deep set foundation on the south up and over the tall towers across the wide channel and on down again to this mass of concrete on which we now stand. They support 200 feet in the air, the roadway of thousands of tons of steel, wrought of the iron ore, mined in our Michigan's Northland that will carry in safety amid breathtaking beauty the coming millions over the blue waters of the world's greatest lakes. It is thrilling, it is satisfying, we are happy to unite our Michigan. Oh, he was a great man, absolutely a great man. Uh, and it hadn't been for him, there would have been, there wouldn't be any bridge. There are a great many people who deserve credit for the structure. Governor Williams, for example, took a leading position. And, um, uh, and a number of other persons went out on the limb, so to speak, to advocate the bridge project. But it was Prentice Brown's prestige and his uh, never failing courage to continue and Governor Williams uh, obviously uh, deserves a great deal of credit politically for getting this thing going. He piqued the imagination of the people of the state of Michigan to have this bridge finally connect the two peninsulas. This indeed is a tremendously great day for Michigan. At long last, after nearly a hundred years of dreaming about a physical link between our two peninsulas, the Mackinac Bridge is a reality. Michigan is at last fully and literally one state. Today, we the people of Michigan give this bridge to America. We dedicate it to the national good as a key link in America's system of a modern arterial highway, as a great gate to the outdoor vacation land of northern Michigan and western Ontario, and as a new northwest passage for the transit of goods and passengers. The first person, as I recall, who went across the bridge was uh, uh, Governor Williams and uh, his wife Nancy and my father, Prentice Brown and my mother Marion Brown and so it was Governor Williams and he bought the first ticket. They wanted to impress upon the public that there were no free passes and even the governor of the state of Michigan had to pay his fare. So he plunked out to 375 for crossing the bridge and that had significance and of course it led to what we all consider a very successful financing of that bridge. Uh, it paid the bills, it paid the interest, it paid the principal. The 375 was about the fare that the uh, ferries had charged to cross. Today we are celebrating a dream come true. With the aid of divine providence, our dream of years has been fulfilled. 
In humility and reverence, we dedicate this work of faith. And with pride, we behold what vision, courage, and determination have wrought. Since the Mackinac Bridge opened to traffic, only one life has been lost as a result of a vehicle going over the side. Quite remarkable for a bridge of such enormity. But there are people who are afraid to cross the structure. Larry Rubin. It's just the strangest reaction you ever saw. It can be a husky, burly truck driver, and he'll cower in the back seat of our, uh, pass of our uh, police cars, put a blanket over his head or whatever, and... Um, go across the bridge in that manner. And some of them were regulars uh, who had to make the trip back and forth. And they'd come in the office and say, OK, get me a driver. I'm ready. <laughs> but I guess the, the most unusual one was the uh, doctor who came up with some of his friends to hunt. They came across northbound. But when they were ready to go southbound, he wouldn't go. He absolutely would not go across on the, on the bridge. He said, suffered enough coming northbound. He wasn't about to do it southbound. He wanted to know where he could charter a boat. Well, I'll make a long story short. We arranged for him to charter a boat run by one of our patrol persons off duty. Uh, and it was about a 14-foot aluminum boat. And by the time they were ready to go, the winds in the straits had uh, uh, come up. And they were running through uh, four-foot waves in this little boat, which is 10 times more dangerous than, 100 times more dangerous than being on the bridge. There is nobody buried in the concrete. That's a standard. Uh, uh, belief around the world that uh, every bridge has somebody buried in the concrete, but it's not so. The world has changed a great deal since 1957. Could the Mighty Mac be built today? And if so, what difficulties might it face? Of course, we, we would have a problem today if uh, we were going to build a bridge uh, due to uh, environmental uh, conditions now that perhaps wouldn't permit the excavation to be just simply dumped back into uh, into the Straits of Akadaw. Uh, however, at that time, uh, the environmental conditions were not that uh, strict. Uh, and of course, this is another reason why we have to look at the bridge as being uh, uh, so easily built within the time frame. Whatever happened to the ferry service between Mackinac City and St. Ignace? Well, they, they went out of business the same day the bridge was open. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, we would never have been able to finance the bridge if the ferries remained in competition. That was one of, the, one of the major provisions of the legislation, that the, within 10 miles either side of the straits, there could be no ferry service. St. Ignace uh, and Mackinac City were always <coughs> great railroad towns. And uh, they were great uh, boat towns, because we had all kinds of ferries around here. And uh, it was difficult uh, for him to know that uh, a lot of the uh, vessel, the, you know, the ferry workers, would be losing their jobs. But uh, he arranged, as did Governor Williams, to have most of these people who were displaced as ferry workers go to work for the highway department uh, all over the state of Michigan. They used to line up there for sometimes back to Sheboygan, 15 miles, plus the dock was full. They wait as high as 23 or four hours for, to get on the boat. Had it not gone through when that legislation was passed, uh, interest rates uh, would have changed to a, such a degree that they would still be ferrying cars across the straits the way they did uh, 38 years ago. You know, the hunters used to enjoy waiting for the boat there. They'd drink and have sandwiches, and get somebody to drive their car and go uptown and browse around for a couple hours. But if the bridge wasn't here, we would have uh, a situation similar to what you see in Puget Sound, uh, you know, Seattle, uh, where there are huge ferries, uh, fast ferries, and it still couldn't handle the traffic. It still would, uh, I think, be a uh, economic blow to the Upper Peninsula as well as the north end of the Lower Peninsula. They'd be lined up to Detroit to get on the boats now. You know, as much traffic as we increase it. So it's been a good thing for us. But what became of the ferries that used to form the link between Michigan's two peninsulas? 
One of them was a potato bowl and this couple of them barges. In the old vacation land, they sold it to Japan. It sunk going across the, the ocean. <laughs> so it's down in, underneath the sea. Since the bridge opened nearly 40 years ago, what has the effect been on the two bridgeheads, Mackinac City and St. Ignace? Let's ask a local innkeeper. Hi, my name is Mike Derry. This is my wife, Chris. Hello. We're the managers of the Ottawa Motel in Mackinac City. Yeah, the bridge walk is fun. Uh, I walked it the last uh, three years. It is a very long walk, uh, but it's beautiful to be up on that bridge. Mackinac is the place. The bridge has been very good to Mackinac City, as far as I can see. It is, uh, at one time, they thought that the south side would dry up. Since the bridge has been built, uh, Mackinac the City has grown business-wise quite a bit. The perception of the Upper Peninsula uh, before the bridge was one of trees and cedar savages. I mean, that was the uh, put-down with which the Upper Peninsula had to deal. Now people are finding out that um, the Upper Peninsula is the most historic uh, place in Michigan area it was settled before the downstate area was. I wouldn't want to live any place else. As you can see, as you look out the window here, it's, uh, they don't come, it doesn't come much better. <laughs> when you travel in and around the Straits area, there are two items that seem to be advertised more than anything else. Fudge and pasties. While fudge is a widely understood term, pasties isn't. So just what is a pasty? And who makes the best? I think the UP does. <laughs> they originated here. We've got a real good recipe. Oh, yeah. We got it from the UP. We're just making a couple of trees at a time here. install of the goodies. <laughs> just right, just put together, it looks just like a machine way. there. Okay. Wow. You now them Ralph Williams and always lived in Mackinac here. We've had a gas station here for 12 years in the last 18. We've had the donut shop. We've been on this corner for 30 years. Been here since the bridge opened. I crossed the street at a gas station in 57. So we've seen a lot of, a lot of changes over the years. Motels springing up gift shops, restaurants. The population hasn't really grown that much. It stays around the thousand population. We've got probably a hundred more businesses than we had 25 or 30 years ago. Before the Mackinac Bridge Authority started any construction on the structure, they elected to hire one photographer to cover all stages of the building of the Mighty Mac. The person they hired was Herman D. Ellis, a noted photographer, teacher, and lecturer. Most of the footage in this program and other programs about the bridge was shot by Herm Ellis. He was a fearless professional whose work displayed tremendous talent and sometimes humor. Here's a scene from one of his travelogues, Islands of the Great Lakes. It's a dream sequence of Herm's showing him placing a flag on top of one of the main towers of the Mighty Mac.
Herm died in 1975, but his amazing images of the Mighty Mac will be around for a long, long time. But what about the bridge? It's been with us for nearly half a century now. How long will it last? If it's properly maintained and kept up, uh, it'll last a thousand years or so. Eventually, I suppose, metal fatigue sets in. We haven't had any indication of that yet, and it's a relatively new phenomenon. But uh, this Dr. Steinman was convinced it would last as long as the pyramids. When we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for, and that men will say, as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see, this our fathers did for us. And, you know, for <clears throat> my dad, who had been in the high councils of government, state, and federal, uh, to think that Mackinac Bridge was the most important thing to him, uh, you know, speaks well for the dream come true. I've been close to tears several times today, but probably closer now than ever before. Thank you all.